Hello and welcome to the recording of the Eckers 3 overview. This is the Early Childhood Environment Rating Scale, the third version. And so if you work in an early childhood setting, um, this is the training for you. If you happen to be an infant or toddler educator, um, we do have our ITERS 3 training um, recording available to you. And if you happen to be joining um, here this recording from a home-based setting, you will want to watch the recording for um, family child care environment reading scale. So that's the Fickers 3. So welcome and we're glad that you're here. If at any point in time you would like to pause um, through this recording so that you can take some notes or you want to reflect, um, feel free to do so. You can watch this as many times as you would like, um, but this is not for training credit. All righty, so there are three of us that are going to be guiding our time together today on this recording. I am Kristen Howard. I am the assessment manager with Great Start to Quality, and I will let my colleagues introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Roundtree. I'm a consultant and trainer with Great Start to Quality. Hello, I am Haley Norris, and I am an assessor with Great Start to Quality. Okay, so let's go into our learning objectives. This is sort of our goal for this time together with you watching this recording. Uh, we would hope that you become more familiar with the Eckers 3 tool. As Kristen said, this is the Early Childhood Environment Rating Scale 3rd Edition overview. So this will be used in preschool center-based classroom settings, so children ages three to five. Uh, again, just as a little reminder, if you're listening to this recording and you're a family child care provider, you're more than welcome to continue to listen, but we would encourage you to listen to our FECRS, which is the family child care recording that is on this web page as well. Um, and so we also uh, want you to become familiar with how the Eckers 3 will be used in Great Start to Quality. So uh, you're watching this, it's after February 1st, our newly reimagined Great Start to Quality has launched and now you have on-site observation choices. So uh, you probably wanna know how Great Start to Quality will be using the Eckers 3 as an on-site observation choice for you. And then as always, we wanna leave you with resources to support you in your continued learning. We know that just watching this recording once or taking notes, uh, you'll need some more support. And so we will guide you and share some resources to support you uh, in that learning. So let's spend a little bit of time here with looking at these acronyms and trying to understand what ERS is and why we're talking about it within Great Start to Quality. So ERS stands for Environment Rating Scale. There's a series of three scales uh, and Great Start to Quality focuses on the third edition. So make sure when you are uh, looking at a scale book or you might try to purchase one or you borrow one from your Great Start to Quality uh, Resource Center that you have the third edition. And Eckers 3 is the tool that we're gonna talk about today. This is the early childhood one. So here on the slide on the left, you'll see the three scales that Kristen Haley and I have been providing training for, and you have access to all three of these recordings on our webpage. Uh, the first one we did was the green book. That's the family child care or feckers or figures. Um, so family child care providers, that is the recording you'll wanna watch and listen to, as that is the tool that will be used if you make feckers three um, your on-site choice. Infant toddler is the itters. Uh, so that is the light blue book. Um, you can find that recording as well. So if you are a center-based infant or toddler educator or administrator, uh, you'll want to listen to that recording as well, which is on this web page. And today we're going to focus on the Eckers 3, which is the yellow scale book. Again, all of these are the third edition. Uh, these uh, tools are nationally and internationally used. They're valid, reliable, and research-based. Um, they provide options for all of you, and what they do is they support preschool educators. Today, we're focusing on Eckers. They support preschool educators uh, in, in, in better ways of thinking about how to use your environment to support those rich interactions with the children within your classroom setting. 
Um, and so that is part of the reason that Great Start to Quality made the shift uh, to include the ERS scales as an on-site observation choice so that you actually have a choice and you feel empowered. Um, and so know that um, when you come to the time that you have uh, an opportunity for an on-site observation with our amazing assessment team, uh, you will be able to choose between class, which is the classroom um, assessment scoring system. And all of those trainings are on our website too. You can listen to those or between ERS. And today we're talking about Eckers, which is the tool that is used in preschool uh, childhood settings. Um, so more information on the class on our webpage for class. Um, so let's learn a little bit more about Eckers 3. And part of this shift as well is it's always about offering access to high quality care, supporting you and making sure that your setting uh, supports children and their families with having high quality. Um, and so also taking that time to reflect about that high quality care and how that looks. And so um, really thinking about the environment piece. And so we'll dive into that deeper today as we go through the scale. And hopefully as you hear us sharing about this Eckers 3 scale, uh, you'll start to see best practice called out and that you're already doing a lot of these pieces. And so you'll have some opportunity to perhaps make some enhancements uh, to reflect and to connect with your teaching team on those pieces. So welcome to this training. So the Eckers 3, uh, which is the yellow scale book, again, is for early childhood uh, environment rating scale, third edition. And as I mentioned earlier, it not only focuses on adult-child interactions, which we know um, the importance of making connections, building relationships with children within your preschool setting, um, but also on how you use the materials and your environment plays a pivotal part uh, in supporting children and their families. This is all uh, developed out of research uh, because we want these tools to be research-based, valid, and reliable. Um, and so there was collaboration with other re relevant fields such as health, development, and education. Uh, there's been a lot of review on these scales. This is the third edition, so know that there's a lot of research, a lot of review on this um, on how the scales are conducted and then adjustments needed uh, to support best practice. And then the last little asterisk on the slide is really important too. Um, this scale was developed based upon collaboration with preschool educators. So there was consultation here with those in the field uh, doing this uh, to make sure that this was relevant and aligned with supporting preschool educators um, to have that insight for thinking about um, best practice and those rich adult child interactions and the use uh, and the impact of the environment. Okay, so during this recording, you're going to hear us talk about on site observation quite frequently, but I did want to call to your attention that the environment rating scale will be used in the self reflection portion of the process. Um, so if you're coming through the Great Start to Quality um, process, you will see um, that there are indicators um, in your self-reflection. And one of those indicators, CIL 11, has um, the program completing either an ERS 3 or an SEL PQA um, self-assessment for every age group or classroom. So if you're in an early childhood setting, you are going to use the ERS-3 self-assessment, which can be found on the Great Start to Quality website. And if you happen to have school-agers, you would use the SELPQA uh, self-assessment uh, for that particular age group. So when you're going through the training today and you're thinking about on-site assessment, on-site observation, um, think also about the self-assessment um, in your um, quality indicators in the self-reflection. So we did just wanna call that out. Um, again, this will be done um, for every age group or classroom um, during that portion of the process. All right, so in these next few slides, um, we're gonna start going over some of the um, the terms and explanations of them um, that are used throughout the scale. Um, if you 
happen to have an Eckers book. Um, these terms can be found on pages 10 through 12. Our first term here is accessible. So accessible means that children can reach and use the materials, furnishings, equipment, and so forth in question. There should be no barriers to children's access. Barriers to access can be physical, such as when furniture blocks an area so it's difficult to get to the materials, or if materials are stored in containers with difficult to open lids. Staff control can also be a barrier to access, such as telling children that a center is closed, um, teaching children not to take certain materials from shelves, or assigning children in areas so they cannot move freely to choose something to play with. If materials are stored in closed spaces, they can be considered accessible only if it's observed that children can freely access and use these materials. It's also important to note that the children must have time to use the materials if they want to. Time counted as materials being accessible must be when all children have reasonable access and are not compelled to be doing something else. This could include finishing a meal, uh, being in a required group time, or napping. So on this slide, we're gonna look at the term engaged. Um, children who are engaged will be interested in paying attention. Uh, this should be differentiated from being just well-behaved, but not necessarily engaged. Children may sit quietly and face the teacher, but unless they show interest in any way, we may not say that they're actually engaged. Um, if you take a look at these pictures here, you can see that the children are making eye contact. Um, they seem to be smiling as they're listening. Um, they're playing with materials. So that's what it would look like for children to be engaged. And our next slide is individualized teaching. Um, I'll just give a quick little overview here as we will talk a little bit more about this later on in the training. Um, individualized teaching involves responding to the variation in the abilities, needs, and interests of children in the group. Um, working with individual children in a systematic way that involves determining the children's ability to do a task or learn a concept, providing support and encouragement, using appropriate strategies that respond to the children's needs and interests, and assessing the success of the child in completing the learning task. Um, ideally, this is most often done in an informal manner uh, with little use of directive teaching strategies. Um, so all children should not be expected to do the same thing at the same time. Okay, let's move on to our next term here. So supporting you in kind of learning uh, these terms that are called out in the Eckers three scale. So as you review this skill yourself or you do your self-reflection or perhaps you uh, select this for your on-site observation tool, uh, you understand sort of what this means and how this might look with on-site observation. So play area is a, splay, is a space may slow down here, is a space where play materials are provided for children to use. So you probably all have play areas in your classroom setting. Uh, and then interest areas are those defined areas uh, for a particular type of play. So you might have dramatic play area, block play area, uh, there could be a science area. So think about uh, right now, just think about your classroom setting and the different areas, interest areas you have, that they're defined, that they're accessible as Haley talked about, the materials are accessible to children, well organized, and that children know the intention of that space. So we don't see children in the block area uh, painting or something like it's they they know what it's meant for and how that's set up. Another thing to really pay attention to uh, when thinking about your classroom uh, environment and setting uh, is to have a quiet area or a cozy area uh, that is separate from the busy area where children know that this is a place where they can go and calm down, sit and read a book quietly, just kind of chill out, have a place, um, but that it's clearly defined uh, and that it's away from the busier areas within your classroom. Uh, we will talk more about this um, when we get into the items of the scale. Kristen and Haley and I will guide you through there, uh, but it's important to be thinking about your play area, uh, the accessibility, the organization, how children use that, sort of having conversations with them, um, thinking about those interest areas as well, and then having a cozy or quiet area uh, away from the busyness for children to intentionally have some time on their own or uh, just to relax or read, um, but thinking about those spaces. 
Another important uh, term that you'll hear in the Eckers three is sort of about some frequency with those adult child interactions and the importance of them. Uh, we know the benefit of having those rich serve and return uh, with each child uh, within your classroom setting. Um, and so when thinking about your practice uh, in, in thinking about the support you offer children, uh, we want to see this happening at least 75% of the time. Uh, so when children have uh, free play, when children are outdoors, when children are at snack or mealtime, uh, washing their hands and you're next to them, that you are engaged, uh, an active participant in their learning. You're looking for opportunities to stretch and expand that learning. And that's part of your general practice, um, that those interactions happen uh, quite frequently and that there's very few exceptions in that. So really um, take stock sort of of your own teaching practices of those interactions with children, your engagement level, uh, as well as your teaching team, especially if you're an administrator, um, have some time to connect on these pieces and think about the importance of usually and general, generally and how that looks within your practice. Another important term that we wanted to spend some time highlighting with the Eckers Three is weather permitting. Uh, here we are in Michigan uh, and there's all sorts of interesting weather that we have, uh, but research shows and we truly believe that best practices children need to spend time outdoors as long as it's weather permitting. So what does that mean? Uh, so Eckers Three says that there is no public health warning due to temperatures that are too high or too low. Um, such as active or active precipitation, such as rain or snow. And so as you see here uh, in this image of this young child outdoors, notice it's, it's sprinkling and it's raining. She's got the right equipment. She has an umbrella, so she's able to be outdoors, which is perfectly fine. The active precipitation that they're stressing here with weather permitting is when it's like torrential rain, heavy snow, high winds, uh, really extreme conditions that make it unsafe for children to be outdoors. Um, and so thinking about modifications within your schedule, if you experience some weather issues, let's say in the morning you normally go outdoors, but it's pouring down rain and it's too much to get children outdoors. Um, but you can look at your schedule and make some modifications because you recognize the importance of children spending time outdoors and the impact that has on their development and their learning. So you adjust your time and you find time in the afternoon because the sun is back out or it's just sprinkling a little and you can safely get children outdoors. So thinking about that modification within your schedule that if you can't go out during your intended time on your schedule that you're looking for adjustments when you can get children outdoors. Okay, we are going to do a little overview of how the scale works. And while you don't need to memorize any of these terms, I'm going to go over it as helpful um, for you to kind of have a working knowledge of, of how the ERS scales work, in particular, um, our focus today of Eckers 3. So the first thing that um, I would like to bring to your attention is the structure of the scale. So the specific scale that we are talking about today is the Eckers three. So that is the scale. Within the scale, um, there are six subscales, which we'll go into more detail um, here in just a moment. Um, those are broken further down into 35 items for the Eckers three. And then the items are broken um, further down into indicators, um, which is some specific uh, wording um, that ties along with each item. So we are going to look at the six subscales. For the Eckers three, the six subscales are space and furnishings, personal care routines, language and literacy, learning activities, interaction, and program structure. So within those six subscales, um, are, you're going to find some items, 35 items. Um, and those are the things that um, the assessment team will be coming out and specifically looking at. So on the next slide, you'll see um, the 35 items of the Eckers three. And again, you're gonna see those six subscales, which kind of can be um, thought of as chapters in a book. And um, each under each heading there of each subscale, you're gonna find the items that pertain to that subscale. 
Um, again, if you need to pause for a moment, um, feel free to do that so that you can kind of just look over the 35 items that are in the Eckers 3. And um, we will get into um, the um, specifics here on the next slide of the indicators. So these are the items. And now we're gonna go ahead and look at a sample. Again, Jen had mentioned before about getting um, a scale book. And this is an example right from the book. So if you happen to have a book and you're following along, um, this is um, under the item number five of child-related display. But please know that you do not have to have a scale book. Um, we're giving you this example right here, right out of the book. Um, but if this is something uh, that you are wanting more information on, definitely um, you can purchase one or borrow one from your local Great Start to Quality Resource Center. And again, we'll talk about that more in detail later. But this is an example right from the book. So if you see the little green arrow, that is pointing to an indicator. And so these indicators um, really are showing specific ways. Um, to show quality based on um, the observation here. These are observable things um, that will be looked at and you will see some under the one category of inadequate, some under the three of minimal, some under the five of good, and indicators of excellent quality under the seven level. Now we're gonna get into scoring uh, later on in our recording here today. But again, we wanted you to understand the words um, because those can, can kind of get a little bit of confusion there going when um, we're talking about items and indicators and such. So, um, so this is just a little brief overview. Again, nothing that you have to memorize. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna continue on with um, a lot of these items today. So you see five of uh, child-related display. We're gonna go into detail on some of these. I wanted to point your attention to um, this slide, which has a little screenshot from the Environment Rating Scales Institute website. So it's called ERSI. And if you go to the ERSI website, uh, you'll be able to get more information um, around all the scales, but you'll see here, if you um, click on the Early Childhood Environment Rating Scale, again, the third edition, um, and you go to introduction, there's a little video introduction, and um, there's all sorts of information, additional notes, um, and things that you might find helpful if you're ready to dive in deeper. Um, one thing that we did want to bring to your attention here with this ERSI website, is in the little green box you're going to see um, at the bottom it says supplementary materials and in that section there is more detailed information around playground guidelines meal pattern guidelines table washing procedures some of the things that will be looked at in the Eckers 3 um, so again if you would like to have some more information around any of those things um, the ERSI website can be found um, right from our Great Start to Quality website. You'll be able to, to find the link right from there. So this is another great resource that we're gonna um, give you now. And then again, later we'll remind you um, that this is a great place to go if you would like more information. All right, so now that you have an understanding um, of the structure of the scale, we're gonna start diving into the subscales and items in the book. We're not going to be digging too deep into each indicator, but rather just giving a high level overview of each item in this scale. So on these next two slides, we'll be looking at the spaces used by the children during the observation. Um, when looking at your indoor space, uh, consider, is there adequate lighting, ventilation control, a comfortable temperature, and reasonable noise level? Um, each of these has an effect on the ability of adults and children to be positive and productive in the classroom. Natural light within the space uh, should be observed and it should be controlled by adjustable blinds or curtains. Um, and ventilation should also be controlled to allow air circulation. Um, this could include having control to your thermostat, opening windows, or turning on a fan. The space should be in good repair and indoor surfaces should be durable and easy to clean and maintain. 
Um, there must be enough indoor space for the maximum number of children allowed to attend at any time, um, as well as your staff. There should be plenty of space for children to participate in varied activities. Staff should be able to move freely and assist the children during meals and snacks while the children are seated at the table. And both children and staff should be able to freely move about the classroom without disrupting others. Um, our next item looks at the furniture used by the children for routine care, play, and learning activities. Um, basic furniture for routine care considered in this item includes tables and chairs for meals and snacks, cubbies for storage of children's personal belongings, and cots and mats for nap time. Basic furniture for play and learning includes tables and chairs where children can use materials and open shelves to store materials that children are able to access independently. Classroom materials should be safe, clean, in good repair and available in sufficient quantity for the total number of children who are present. Um, children should also have access to cubbies or some sort of personal storage within the classroom. There should be at least two pieces of furniture, each designed for a different specific activity used for that activity. Um, so this could include an easel for art, um, a standard water table, housekeeping furniture, um, or a woodworking bench. And then lastly in this item, there should be soft furnishings accessible to the children. Padded or cushioned surfaces that children can relax on with little to no contact with the hard surface are required to give credit. So examples include um, several large pillows gathered together on a rug, um, a cushioned chair or couch, um, a small mattress or a beanbag chair. So the arrangement of the spaces used by the children in a classroom affects how well staff can enhance children's learning and supervise them to protect their well-being. The space should be arranged so that um, classroom pathways generally do not interrupt play. There should be at least five different interest areas observed being used. Um, I know Jen touched base on this in the explanation of terms. Um, and one of those five must be a clearly defined cozy area that is protected from active play. Um, and centers requiring more space, such as blocks and dramatic play, must have sufficient space to ac accommodate the type of play required and the number of children who want to participate. Quiet play areas, including interest centers, such as books, manipulatives, art, writing, um, should be separated by physical space from noisier play areas and centers, um, such as dramatic play, blocks, and music and movement. So these quiet and noisy activities should not coexist in the same multi-purpose multi play area. Um, so when looking at your space, just take a look at, um, say, where your book area is in relation to that um, block area or that dramatic play area. Um, they really should be probably across the room from each other um, and not adjacent. So space for privacy, um, children must be allowed to play alone or with a friend uh, without interfering with other children's access to play areas or interest centers designed for more children. At the lower levels of quality in this item, uh, space for privacy can be found or created spontaneously by children, either indoors or outdoors, uh, but at the higher level, a specific indoor space should be set up by the staff to discourage interruptions. While a child may select to use a space for privacy, this does not eliminate the teacher's responsibility for interacting with the child. Um, children who use the space should not be ignored. Um, staff should supervise the space to ensure that there are no problems, such as other children intruding. For a space for privacy to work well, the children in the group must learn that the space is special, um, that it's a space protected from others and no one can interfere with the child or children in that space. So it's the job of the staff to ensure that children understand the rules for this space and supervise the space to protect it as needed. Child-related displays. So the primary purpose for displaying materials in a classroom is to extend the children's learning experiences. Meaningful materials that are of interest to children should be displayed where children can easily see them. Two-dimensional or flat work, um, such as paintings, collages, drawings, photographs, charts, and posters, um, can be displayed on bulletin boards, walls, doors, um, or on the backs and sides of the low open shelves where accessible materials are stored. Three-dimensional objects, such as sculptures or constructions, uh, may be displayed on the top of shelves or hung from the ceiling. 
Um, at the higher levels, about one third of the displayed materials should be children's individualized artwork. And about half of the displays should be related to current interests of the children in the group. Um, and one, if someone coming into your classroom, such as assessors, um, should be able to tell what the children's interests are or what they're discussing. It's also important that staff are observed using those displayed materials to encourage informal conversations with the children, um, as well as pointing out and reading words in a display in a way that interests the children to help make the connection between the spoken and printed word. In our next slide, uh, we'll go over the last two items in this subscale, uh, which are space for gross motor and gross motor equipment. So both indoor and outdoor spaces are acceptable for gross motor play, um, but we know that outdoor space usually allows for more freedom of movement. At least one adequate gross motor space, either inside or out, must be used for at least 15 minutes during the observation. Um, and the indoor space should really only be used if there is inclement weather. The observed gross motor space should be spacious enough to allow vigorous play, um, including running and the use of wheel toys. And the space should be easily accessible to the children. Um, at the excellent level, the observed gross motor space should have at least two types of play surfaces, one hard and one soft, um, so that different types of activities are possible. The space should also have at least two convenient features, such as shade, good drainage, a water fountain, um, close to the bathrooms, accessible storage for portable equipment, um, and or direct access from the classroom. And then lastly, the space should be arranged and used so that different activities do not interfere with one another. Uh, for example, play with wheel toys um, is separated from climbing equipment and ball play. And then there are many types of equipment that are used to encourage the development of large muscle skill and coordination. This item covers the appropriateness of gross motor equipment for the children who use it to ensure that children have safe opportunities to fully practice necessary skills. We will look at gross motor equipment both indoors and out. So at the higher levels, there should be enough age appropriate equipment, both stationary and portable, to interest all the children and keep them active and involved and this equipment must be accessible for at least 30 minutes during the observation. Equipment should be ample. Um, children shouldn't have to wait to use the type of equipment that they're most interested in using. There should be enough of the most popular items, um, such as balls or bikes, so that children can experience little, if any, wait times to use those items. And there should be materials that um, encourage more advanced age-appropriate skills to better meet the individual needs of the children in the group. In the case of inclement weather, uh, gross motor equipment must be observed being used indoors and should be plentiful to interest and engage all the children. So our next subskill we're gonna look at is personal care routines. Our first one is meals and snacks. So it's important to note that children should not go more than three hours without eating. Children should be offered nutritious food throughout the day. Um, all components of a meal or snack should always be served together. Um, so this means that milk and fruit should always be offered alongside solid food when children are eating a meal. Um, the milk and fruit should not be served before or after. Children should be encouraged to help during meals and snacks. Have them help set the table, um, clear the table, and or serve themselves. Meal times should be flexible and pleasant for the children with many conversations and social interactions. Sanitary practices should be met as well. Um, this includes cleaning the tables, um, hand hygiene, hand hygiene um, occurring both before and after eating, and serving food on plates or napkins and not directly on tabletops. So toileting and diapering looks at the basic sanitary procedures for toileting, as well as diaper and toileting schedule and proper supervision. Proper sanitizing requirements include um, pro uh, proper hygiene for both children and staff, making sure the toilet is flush between uses, um, and sanitizing the sink as needed. The toileting schedule should be individualized, um, so children should be able to use the bathroom as needed. If you do have children who may still be in diapers or pull-ups, um, they should be checked and changed at least every two hours. 
Uh, there should be child-sized toilets and sinks. Uh, soap and paper towels should be accessible to the children. And staff should be responsive to the children's personalities and needs. You may have children who need to be watched more closely as they use the toilet. Um, point out hand washing steps and procedures to children who may need that extra support with their hand hygiene. Health practices, um, this is the general health and nap related issues, uh, which are evaluated in this item. Um, much effort should be made to decrease, decrease the spread of germs. Um, make sure you're being a good model of health practices and help the children learn how to properly carry out hygiene practices by providing positive teaching interactions during these health related practices. Um, so there are five categories of hand washing that we'll be observing for this item. Um, upon arrival into the classroom and re-entering after being outside, before and after shared use of wet materials such as Play-Doh or water, after play with shared sensory materials such as sand or after messy play, after dealing with bodily fluids, and after touching contaminated objects and surfaces such as trash cans or pets. So children should be able to consistently and independently carry out most health practices correctly without help from staff. Um, there should be evidence that the children have been taught the correct procedures. Um, and this could be as simple as singing a hand washing sign to, song to guide themselves through the hand washing routine. And at that excellent level, um, we're gonna look for picture um, and word reminders or instructions of required health practices to be displayed and used with the children when needed. Um, this could include how to properly wash your hands, um, toothbrushing, or nose wiping. And next is safety practices. So there are two aspects of safety that are considered in this item. The hazards that children encounter in the environment and the supervision provided by the staff. During the observation, both indoor and outdoor safety hazards will be considered. Um, just know that not all hazards are given the same weight in scoring. So a major safety hazard carries a high risk of serious injury and an accident resulting from this type of hazard would require a hospital or doctor visit for treatment. Minor safety hazards carry a lower risk of injury and they're far less likely to occur than accidents from major hazards. So a good resource to use when determining safety concerns um, can be found on the ERSI website under playground guidelines. At the high quality level of supervision, Staff do not only pay attention to safety problems and stop problems before they become dangerous, but they manage supervision responsibilities to ensure all areas that children use are supervised as needed. Staff should also be paying close attention when children are involved in activities that carry higher risk and adjust their supervision to do this. Uh, we know that when the risk is greater, the supervision must be more attentive. So our next subscale, that we're going to take a look at is language and literacy. So the first two items I'm gonna talk about are helping children expand vocabulary and encouraging children to use language. When looking at expanding children's vocabulary, this item assesses the major aspects of staff to child communication needed by children three to five years of age. So these include ensuring that staff members use many different words with children, um, talking about children's concrete experiences with the things they play with and what they see or do. Provide a reasonably quiet environment so that children can hear what is being said. Um, use many exact words that name people, places, things, and actions that children understand. And use words and describe the people, places, things, and actions that children experience. And then lastly, Add many new topics and different experiences for children. If using unfamiliar words, make sure you're correctly explaining the meaning of those words in a way that children will understand, and that add information and ideas to expand on the children's understanding of these words. Next, children need to use language to communicate with others to express their needs, desires, and interests. Staff should encourage children to communicate verbally by asking questions about their play, their home life, and other interests. This requires that staff remain close to the children to see what they're doing and to talk with them. Uh, we all know that children talk when they have something interesting to talk about. 
That's why it is important to have many activities and materials that children enjoy exploring and playing with. So there are three major aspects of communication that are required in this item. The first is how staff use questions to encourage children to talk with them. Second is the extent to which the staff responds to children's communications. And the third is about the use of conversations between staff and children to help extend their verbal ability. Um, so these conversations should be taking place throughout all times of the day. On our next slide, uh, we'll take a look at the staff use of books with children and encouraging children's use of books. So we know that children who regularly have books read to them progress from turning the pages and studying the pictures, to selecting their favorite stories, anticipating the next action in a story, telling the story themselves, and then finally reading on their own. Um, staff should read well, showing interest, enjoyment, and enthusiasm, especially when reading to larger groups. Book times should be free of outside interruptions and not be used during transition when it's difficult to pay attention, nor should they be used as a time filler. There should be appropriate books that relate, relate to current classroom activities or themes that are read to or used with the children. Staff should use books formally and informally and use books with children to help answer questions and to provide information on things that children are curious about. So this can be staff initiated or it can happen when a child shows curiosity or need for an answer and staff can lead them to a book and help them use it. It's important that the content of a book is discussed in a way that really engages the child. Encouraging children's use of books is really helping children develop an enjoyable relationship with books and reading. In this item, we will focus on where books are located, how the space with books is set up and organized, the number and topics of accessible books, whether children use these books as self-initiated choice or a staff-imposed requirement, and whether staff notice and respond positively to children who are using books. So there should be at least 15 books accessible to the children, um, and this is at the minimal level. Accessible books must be suitable for the age and development of the children in the group, and a wide selection of books must be available. For example, topics could include people, feelings, um, nature and science, self-help skills, sports and hobbies, math, um, cultures, varying races, jobs, um, and abilities. Also, look to add books that relate to current classroom activities or themes. Uh, all books should be organized in a defined reading center with a place to store the books for easy access. The covers of the books should be easily seen. Um, they should be easily um, taken off of a shelf or a bin, and children should have comfortable furnishings to use them. On our next slide, is our last item in the subscale, becoming familiar with print. So print should be related to the interesting experiences children are offered. Staff must show interest in the print, uh, reading it to the children and relating print to what it represents. Print should be a natural part of interactions with a connection to what it is and how it works to create words um, that the children will read and understand. Uh, visible print should be combined with pictures to help children make the connection between the symbol and its spoken meaning. Staff must also show that print is a useful tool by explaining how or why print is used. Uh, this could be as simple as pointing to and reading the menu when a child asks what's for lunch, or pointing out and explaining the picture uh, word class schedule when a child asks when they will go outside. So at the highest level of quality here, um, picture and print materials should relate to current topics and show a variety of words. Staff should be observed writing down what a child says in a way that engages the child. Staff should point out letters and words as they read print, helping children hear the sounds of the letters or words. And lastly, picture and word instructions are used to guide children through multi-step activities. Um, this include, could include proper hand washing um, or in the order in which snow gear should go on. Um, it's important to be mindful here of the word used. So just having these steps posted in the classroom is not enough to receive credit. A child must be observed doing the procedure according to the directions 
or staff must point out the instructions to a child. So next, Jen is going to dive into learning activities with all of you. Thanks, Haley. So we're going through the items in the Eckers 3 scale. Remember, Kristen did a lovely job talking about that this is the scale and then the six subscales. And Haley went through several of the items. And so now I'm going to pick up on learning activities, which is the subscale. And we will walk through all of these um, items here. I'm going to pull them all up so you can see them. Again, if you have a scale book, feel free to follow along. Um, but if you don't, it's perfectly fine. And just remember, uh, there's a lot of information that we're sharing in this recording. Uh, this is meant just to be to help you become familiar. Uh, we're not diving in depth into the indicators and, and a lot of the specifics, but we're hope, um, helping you have an overview and understanding of this on-site tool so that you could um, Use this for your self-reflection, as Kristen mentioned, with great start to quality and have some understanding of what is meant there. And then if you choose to use this for your on-site observation, if this is a choice that you choose to make for your preschool classroom. So um, let's dive into these learning activities. And before we go into them, there's a few things that you will start to sort of see a pattern of as we talk through these. Um, you're gonna hear us use terms such as accessible. You even heard Haley talk about that. So, so thinking about um, these items as are the materials accessible to the children? Um, do you have to go get them out? Are they locked away? Are they out of reach? Are they in tight baskets or containers? Are they not organized? Thinking about accessibility. Um, also thinking about how the staff within the classroom uh, control access to these materials. So uh, within your play space, thinking, you know, with the fine motor materials or art materials, are you saying to children, oh, this is closed today, um, the art area is closed or the block area is closed, that's a barrier. So that would not be considered as accessible when thinking about the use and access for children. So we're trying to remove those barriers. And then thinking about your interactions with children as they do these activities. So are you a partner in their play? Are you coming alongside them? Are you doing those serve and return uh, interactions, which we know um, the impact to support the high quality learning for children? Um, and are you engaged in, support, in supporting and extending children through their learning? So keep those in mind as we go through those learning activities and we continue to dive into the scale. So I'm first, going to start with fine motor and we know the importance of having fine motor experiences and materials set up for children in a preschool classroom. Um, the Eckers 3 scale uh, specifically calls out in many of these items um, very specific materials sometimes that you should have or a number of materials and again this aligns with best practice. These numbers weren't just random or decided upon uh, without any intentionality, uh, these are best practice to, to support the children with that learning piece. So um, for fine motor, we're talking specifically about several sorts of materials that um, are best to have within a preschool classroom. So interlock, interlocking building materials, such as interlocking blocks of various sizes, um, art materials, so thinking crayons and scissors, that really supports the fine motor development with children. Manipulative, so thinking about stringing beads, pegs and peg boards, uh, sewing cards, table blocks, and then puzzles. So thinking about the fine motor engagement with puzzles. Again, these materials need to be accessible to children, uh, that they're well organized, children know how to use these, and that staff are engaged in supporting the learning throughout so that you're modeling how to use them. You're um, supporting children with, uh, if they're building uh, with interlocking blocks or they're putting a puzzle to give it together, like helping them think about, oh, I wonder, you know, which gear might work best or, oh, what piece do you think might be missing or should we add to this puzzle? Uh, so having that intentional conversation to really support that learning. Uh, so those are some things to keep in mind with fine motor. Next, we're going to talk about art as a learning activity and the art materials uh, that are best practice to have within your preschool setting. So again, very specific materials here called out. We're, we're talking about drawing materials, uh, having access to paint, three-dimensional objects such as Play-Doh, wood scraps, clay boxes, collage materials and tools. And so when we're talking art tools, we're talking about scissors, tape, hole punchers, uh, hole punches, rulers, stencils, stamps with pads, 
Uh, and then having access, of course, to paper to use these materials. Um, so really thinking about your art uh, area, thinking about that accessibility piece and thinking about your engagement and the staff within that classroom uh, supporting children as they're using materials. So if you introduce children to clay, do you spend time talking to children about the care and storage of the clay, how to use the materials appropriately? Um, as children are painting, are you having conversations with them about their drawings, asking, oh, I, I wonder what you might want to title this. Do you want to give your, your painting a title? Uh, where should we hang it? Letting children display their art within your classroom. Um, that some of the art activities or experiences that you have set up with children are um, related to classroom themes or interests. So perhaps you go to an apple orchard and you come back and you decide to paint pictures of the apples that you had with children and you're mixing the colors of the reds and the greens for the apples. Um, perhaps it's tied into a favorite book and you have an art experience set up. Um, that staff, and so again, talking about staff, not just the main teacher, uh, but any staff that is interacting and engaging with children for, again, that majority of time, not just, you know, popping in here or there, but majority of the time thinking about the staff in the room, uh, that you're taking time to support children with dictations or writing captions of their artwork uh, to be displayed with that, that you're having conversations with them about how they're using those materials or things that they want to do next, or perhaps there are art materials that might be missing that children are interested in adding uh, so that the art area is based upon the children's interest and what they would like to see. Maybe children really want to add pink tape or uh, they want to make some purple Play-Doh. Um, and so thinking about how to expand and, and really invest and support children with that learning experience with those art materials. Another learning activity we're going to spend a little time uh, talking about today is music and movement and how that looks within your preschool setting. So again, having access to instruments, music materials, if they're accessible to children, uh, that during free play, uh, children and staff are engaged in those, um, that there is some dance opportunities that are happening. And here's one thing to be mindful of with um, any of these uh, learning activities that we're talking about. Uh, especially music and movement and art, that children are, are not forced or made or required to do the art or music and movement experience, but that if they are not interested, there's an alternative activity uh, that is available to them that will challenge them and support them as well, and that staff is um, providing them access to those materials. Another thing with music and movement is a lot of times we hear background noise within classrooms and that's perfectly fine, uh, but just be mindful that it does not interfere with any other activity that it's overwhelming or overstimulates children if the music is too loud. And that again, when thinking about those interactions of you and the staff within that classroom setting that you're encouraging preschoolers to experience with rhyming or rhythm, you're talking about tempo and beat, how to use and hold instruments, the proper care of them, uh, and that you're positively encouraging children, that you're engaged in an active participant in that music and movement activity as well. Let's continue on learning with these learning activities. We're going to spend a little time talking about your block area and block materials. Uh, so thinking about having unit blocks and large hollow blocks. So again, this is part of your self-reflection, looking at your preschool setting, talking to your teaching team and administrators about what you might want to add to your classroom or the arrangement, as Haley talked about, having that, that well-defined block area that has enough space for children to be engaged, to build block structures where they're not trying to build on like fluffy carpet, but they have a secure stable base for their block structures and that there's enough space. And again, when we talk about spacing for children, uh, we're talking about for the maximum number of children that you could have within your classroom setting on any day. So perhaps uh, you're having an on-site observation and there's only eight children there, but you could have up to 12 children and you're thinking about enough materials if all 12 children were present and trying to use the blocks because sometimes that block area is very popular and everyone wants to be there. Another thing to keep in mind with your blocks as you think about the variety of materials and the organization and the access, you're thinking about those accessories for blocks. So we know that when children build block structures, sometimes they wanna build a zoo, uh, they might wanna build a farm, they might wanna build a house. They like to have some people or animals or vehicles to add to those. Uh, and so that you have those accessories um, available for children to extend and enrich that block structure, that block experience play. 
Um, and that when you're organizing and you're labeling any of these, so going back even to when we were talking about fine motor art, music, and blocks, when you're labeling that you have pictures in the printed words, that ties into Haley's a conversation and guidance with printed materials um, so that children are seeing the print as well as the picture and making those connections and it also helps with the organization of that area. And again, thinking about the engagement of staff during that block play. So they're having conversations with children, they're asking questions, they're building upon that, they're looking for opportunities to have math conversations, uh, to talk about written language, perhaps you're making a sign for one of your block areas, or they want to save their block area, and you're helping children to figure out how to write that word or to communicate that to other children. And that staff are pointing out concepts that are demonstrated in unit blocks. Um, and so they're talking about maybe about shapes or the number of blocks, or maybe you're getting a measuring tape out and you're measuring how long the block structure is. Uh, so thinking about those ways to be interactive and supportive with that play. Next, we're gonna talk about dramatic play. And again, um, this is important to have a dramatic play as your interest area, uh, that there's many and very dramatic play materials. So again, enough for the number of children possible within that classroom setting. Uh, so you're thinking about dolls or child-sized furniture, play foods, cooking, eating utensils, dress up clothes, uh, in that they're gender neutral, right? So uh, you're not have all, princess dress ups, um, but you're thinking about all the gender, all the abilities within your dramatic play, thinking about all the cultures of supporting. So maybe you have some takeout menus from some local restaurants, maybe you have um, some food boxes from um, various cultures uh, that have written words or images. Um, and so you're really um, supporting children with seeing diverse dramatic play areas as well. Uh, and that you're part of that conversation, you're part of that learning and engagement. Uh, and, you're, and you're helping children um, think about how to use the materials. Maybe you, there's a little restaurant set up in the dramatic play area. And so you're having some conversations about the menu and how to order and will the chef cook this for me today? and and uh, you're talking to children about some math concepts. Well, how much is my bill? Oh, it's $10. Well, here, and, and you're supporting children with all of those pieces. Uh, you're looking for ways to incorporate print, uh, literacy awareness, math within that dramatic play as well. And then finally, we're gonna talk about nature and science with these learning activities. And so recognizing the importance of having uh, nature with inside your classroom setting. Perhaps you have some living plants that children water and care for. Maybe you have a class pet. Uh, maybe you have some baskets from Nature Walks where you collected some um, pine cones or some stones and that children have access again to these materials, uh, that they're accessible and that you're really helping children understand the importance and the beauty of nature, that you're taking children with outdoors, you're noticing things within the environment, you're uh, supporting children with understanding of how to be caretakers and good stewards of our earth. Uh, so maybe you're talking about recycling, maybe you're talking about turning lights off when you leave the classroom or making sure the water's turned off after children wash their hands. Um, and that you're thinking about ways to incorporate uh, nature and science uh, within your, your day, within your daily schedule. Um, and so just supporting children, um, being a good steward, having those conversations and having uh, various nature materials within your classroom for children to access. So Haley spent a lot of time talking about literacy, language literacy within the Eckers 3, and I'm going to spend a little time here talking about math. We're going to go over several of these items that fall under the math umbrella and ways to be thinking about uh, things that you're already doing within your preschool setting or ways to enhance a preschool set, a setting because the Eckers 3 really does a lot of heavy focus on language literacy and math because as we all know, as preschool educators and administrators, that we're preparing children to enter school and we wanna start early that spark and that love of learning for language, literacy and math. And so how that might look. Um, so math materials. So thinking about things that children can count, compare, uh, ha have access to comparing and counting, measuring, comparing sizes. So thinking some about some opportunity to support children in understanding fractions, a familiarity with shapes. And again, the Eckers 3 skill has some really specific things uh, that you might want to take a look at when you're doing some reflection within your own preschool setting uh, or preparing for on-site observation. And again, this all aligns with best practice. 
And so those math activities are teacher initiated and directed and go beyond children's use of math activities and free play with teacher input. This is not just like during free time or dramatic play. This is intentional math activities to support those rich math concepts that we wanna see children. Um, and that you're frequently joining in um, with the math activity that they're supporting thinking about, again, and have children with counting, uh, with numbers, uh, with thinking about uh, as simple as at snack time, um, how many goldfish do you have on your napkin and, and counting and sorting or going back to those nature items. Perhaps you have a basket of pine cones within your classroom and you have children sort by size or textures. And so there's some comparison and con contrasting of things. Um, perhaps you're doing something with fractions and you're showing children how to divide. Um, perhaps you have are measuring children's height, right? And so you're pulling, you know, measuring children, you're writing down their height, you're comparing that uh, and communicating and supporting children with those math terms. Uh, those are really key things to keep in mind with those math materials and activities um, that they are part of daily events within your setting. Um, and that children are understanding written numbers. So they have opportunities to write these numbers, uh, to look at them, to see them. When they look around the classroom environment, they see printed numbers. So they might see a poster from maybe one to 20. And by the one, there's one item, two, two items. You have books within your classroom that have math concepts. Um, perhaps it's a book about sorting or comparison or fractions and that those are part of your book uh, baskets. And so children have access to those. And again, thinking about the intentional participation of the staff. So all staff within that setting are frequently looking for ways to support math concepts. And on the slide right here are just several other ways uh, to be uh, supporting children with math development within your preschool setting. Um, and thinking about um, how this is part of your everyday environment. So taking some time, maybe connecting as a teaching team, connecting with other preschool educators, or even reaching out to your local Great Start to Quality Resource Center, um, to the experts there to help, that will help support you in thinking about these math concepts and ways to incorporate them within your classroom to align with the, these items to support children with that math awareness. All right, so we have been hearing about a lot of items and I know it's a lot of information. Again, a reminder, if you need to pause the recording at all, just to stop and reflect and take some notes, uh, you're welcome to do that. We're gonna keep moving forward and uh, now we're gonna discuss promoting acceptance of diversity. So this is item um, 26 of the Eckers 3. And we know, right, we've been hearing Jen and Haley talk about a lot of things that are just best practice. And so we know promoting diversity in early childhood is best practice. And some of these things that you're gonna see and hear about, you're probably like, we're already doing this. And that's wonderful. Um, so we're gonna point out some of the things um, that are really key um, to success in the Eckers 3 with promoting acceptance of diversity. Um, so to give credit for diversity materials, we need to see um, that the children can easily see or access the materials or display items that are represented. So again, going back to all of the things that we've been hearing about, um, children need to have access, they need to be easily seen. Um, this is not something that you tuck away into a cupboard. Um, these are things that should be readily available at all times, um, not just during a specific thematic unit. Again, um, and these things should be out all, all the time. Um, we are not saying um, that this is an all-inclusive uh, list here of things or examples on the, on the screen. Um, these are just some ideas for you. Um, don't run right out and buy some things if you if you don't have it. Um, you can get creative even and create some of these materials yourself. Um, all right, so some examples of diversity materials um, include images and books, easily visible displays, um, music played from a variety of cultures. So maybe you have instruments that you're uh, that you have out accessible, um, but you're also playing um, culturally. Uh, appropriate music, um, foods from different cultures, dolls, 
dress ups in the dramatic play, um, puppets, all sorts of things. Um, and what we are really wanting to hit home today is that these materials are not just in the environment. It's extending that, and, and Jen and Haley have been talking about this with every item, right? To be successful, we want to see that extension. We want to see the staff going um, above and beyond and really providing the opportunities, um, having conversations with children, right, about um, maybe differences of people, um, maybe really making sure that we're not using um, different stereotypes, um, and really making sure that these items are found um, all over the environment, um, but we will be focusing on making sure that we're seeing two different types in dramatic play. Um, so you wanna make sure that there, there is representation in dramatic play. And then um, making sure that you are promoting the acceptance of diversity in your learning activities. So thinking about how, again, how you can extend not just placing these items um, out for the children to access, but how you can really engage in the actual um, learning opportunities, the activities that you're doing. Um, again, thinking about music, thinking about small group time, thinking about all the parts of your day and how you can incorporate diversity. All right, we are going to move on to appropriate use of technology. And this is one item that can be marked NA. It can be scored not applicable if you do not use technology in your setting. So if um, an assessor comes out and you do not use any audiovisual devices at all during that three hour observation, um, this would be scored in NA and it would not be counted um, towards the score or against the score at all. Um, so this is, is one of those few exceptions uh, that can be any. Um, if you do use audiovisual devices, technology in your classroom, we want to make sure that there's um, alternate activities available, at least three, right? So again, children are not forced to um, sit on an iPad. Um, they have the opportunity to do other things. And then really making sure that you're limiting that time to to um, no more than 15 minutes at a time. Um, during that time, we wanna see staff really involved with the children using technology. Again, this is not um, go sit at um, this particular part of the classroom um, by yourself for 15 minutes and, and sit on this iPad. Really, it's really getting the, um, the staff involved and really using it to support and extend classroom learning. So um, again, it, we probably sound like a broken record when we're talking about all of these things, um, but it's that definite um, support from the teacher that we are gonna be looking for. Um, I want to mention that all the content viewed by children in your setting should be appropriate. And while we think, why, well, gosh, of course, we would never show something violent or um, something that so shows antisocial behavior, um, you have to really remember that all content viewed, including commercials, might have some negative messages that you're not even, um, you didn't even know that we're going to show up. So some of these different um, children's learning channels on YouTube and other places where we find children's music, um, right? They they have some commercials that pop up. So please make sure that you're screening um, all of the technology before you're showing it to children to make sure that it is appropriate um, because we know some things can sneak in there. Um, and even if it was not your intent for an inappropriate commercial to pop up, it would be scored um, based on what was shown to the children that day. All right, so Jen and Kristen touched base um, on some of the interaction pieces while they went over activities with you. Um, now I'm gonna go over the interaction subscale and the five items within that subscale. Um, supervision of gross motor, 
individualized teaching and learning, staff-child interaction, peer interaction, and discipline. So the requirements of supervision of gross motor are based on supervision provided by staff during gross motor activity times of the day, um, such as outdoor physical play and indoor gross motor play. Um, so this will occur either in the class or classroom or in another indoor space. Um, staff must actively supervise children throughout the observed gross motor time, uh, showing awareness of all areas and all children in the space. Staff-child interactions should be positive and much interest must be shown to children who participate in gross motor activity, um, rather than to those children who are participating in less active play options, such as sand play or drawing with chalk. During these interaction, interactions, staff should initiate vigorous gross motor activities, um, which could be organizing a race for children who want to participate, um, or set up and encourage children to participate in an obstacle course with materials such as tumbling mats, tunnels, and a balance beam. And lastly, help children develop new skills. Um, show them how to use equipment that requires more skill. Uh, this can be as simple as showing a child how to hold and toss a Frisbee. Individualized teaching and learning. Um, so I know I briefly touched base on this item <clears throat> in the beginning of the training. Um, so it's important to recognize that children have differing abilities and personalities. Individualized teaching requires that staff meet the learning needs of each child rather than teaching to meet the needs of a large group. Activities should be open-ended and staff should be circulating through the classroom, adding individualized learning to children's activities. So this could be counting blocks with a child who built a tower, uh, showing a child how to play a sorting game, or having a conversation with a child involved in dramatic play. Make sure that you're enhancing the child, children's play and not just interrupting. Also, staff-directed activities must allow children to be successful. Um, children should participate with interest and are not forced to complete tasks that are too difficult. It's important to note that all children deserve your attention and that no child should be ignored throughout the observation. Staff-child interaction includes both verbal and nonverbal communications between the adults and children. So for this item, interaction refers to the ways in which staff relate to the children. Uh, once again, interaction should be positive uh, with staff who are supportive and comforting. Staff should give a message of warmth through the appropriate physical contact and should be sensitive to children's nonverbal cues and respond accordingly. Staff who are respectful to children and guide them positively, let the children know they are valued. And when this is a consistent daily practice, a staff will create a relaxed and pleasant atmosphere for their classrooms. Interactions among children, uh, which are those peer-to-peer -peer interactions, refers to the relations children form with one another, how well they play together and whether they ignore each other, fight, or get along well. Um, it's the job of the staff to help children develop these positive social skills. It's important that children have time to choose who they'd like to play with at free time or sit next to at lunch. Uh, staff should be providing some opportunities for children to work together to complete a task. This could be encouraging a few children to get cots out for a nap, um, having a couple of children set the table for lunch together, uh, or having a group of children decorate the room for a special occasion. It's also important that staff, staff help the children avoid conflicts. The arrangement and use of, a, of the space, um, the staff's expectations of children, staff supervision, the daily schedule, and the materials that are accessible to the children will all have an effect on how well children can get along in a program. Uh, make sure you're bringing attention to the good social behavior by saying something to the children so they know what that specifically what staff notice. Um, so an example of this practice could include praising children who help others. Um, for example, wow, see how Danny helped David hang up his coat so it would not fall out of his cubby? Thanks, Danny. Um, just always make sure you're pointing out children's positive social behavior towards one another. And then our last item in this subskill is discipline, uh, which is the methods used by staff to manage children's behavior. At the higher levels of quality, 
the emphasis is on teaching self-discipline to children in a realistic way without demanding what children are not yet able to do. Expectations for children should always be appropriate and children should be aware of classroom rules and generally follow them with a reasonable amount of teacher control. Staff should explain reasons for why they cannot permit specific behaviors. Um, so if you have someone who hits, gently explain that hitting hurts and that we can't hit our friends in class. Uh, staff should never respond with anger or neg negativity towards children's inappropriate behavior. Um, instead, call attention to children's feelings and the relationship between children's actions and other responses, such as, look at her face, she's upset now, or you gave him the crayon and that made him happy. If there is a conflict, actively involve the children in solving their conflicts and problems without telling them what to do. Um, so this is where we would see that conflict resolution taking place. And then lastly, staff should be using child-friendly procedures to minimize problems. This includes maintaining a dependable routine, keeping children busy, challenged, and interested, especially during transition times, um, avoiding competition and crowding, and providing plenty of time for children to get rid of energy through physical play. And with that, on our next slide, we will take a look at our last subscale program structure. In this first item, transition and waiting times, we examine what children actually experience, experience each day in terms of how time is used with a concentration on transitions, which is the time spent changing from one event to the next what the children are doing during these times, and the types of materials they can use. So transitions should be gradual or individualized, and there should be no waiting time of three minutes or longer during any observed transition. Children should be able to begin eating as soon as they sit at the table. Um, a teacher should begin circle time, even though some children may still be cleaning up. Um, staff should almost always be prepared for the next activity. Children should not have to sit and wait for staff to bring out small group materials or sit and wait for uh, staff to prepare lunch plates. Also, make transitions smooth. Uh, warn the children that cleanup time is coming. Do an activity with children while waiting to transition or allow children to stay actively involved until the next activity is ready. Free play requires an organized structure in which the choices are clear to children Safe options are plentiful, and staff, staff supervise children to ensure the children are productive and engaged. At that high quality level, free play should take place for at least one hour during the observation, including some time inside and some outside, weather permitting. Uh, children should have many choices of engaging materials and equipment to use during free play, and these materials and equipment should be ample so there is little or no competition over the use of materials. If children do have to wait to use a certain item or complete a special activity, there should be a clear system used to assure that children um, will have a chance to do what they're interested in. So this could be using a timer or a waiting list to ensure all children get a turn. There should be materials or activities that relate to topics of interest or a curtain theme, and staff should be observed using a wide variety of words to expand children's knowledge during free play. And then we have the whole group activities for play and learning. This item is specifically concerned with how any observed whole group learning activities are handled with children. Uh, this learning requires that children are engaged and interested. So group times should allow for children to be actively involved and staff should maintain flexible. Um, you should be mindful that preschoolers can pay attention only for relatively short periods in large groups. Uh, large group times can be successful if they're short, include experiences that children enjoy doing together, focus on topics of current interest, and are handled positively by staff. They are also more successful if children are not forced to remain in the group. Staff should allow children to leave whole group in order to work in another area that is more satisfying to them. Um, that doesn't mean that it it's a free-for-all um, and every area is open for the children to play in. Let's set a couple activities aside for those children who are having a hard time engaging in uh, their whole group. Um, it's also important to note that whole group activities are not required in high quality early childhood programs. 
Um, so this is the other one item in the Eckers 3 scale that we can score not applicable if no whole group activities are ever used. Okay, thank you, Haley. We are going to dive into some scoring. And while it's important that you understand some basic principles of um, scoring the Eckers 3 and any of the, the ERS scales, um, we don't expect you to, to understand this on a high level um, because we just want you to really understand that this is truly about um, improving quality. So um, if you happen to have a scale book, um, you will find more detailed information um, about the scoring system on page nine. All right, so let's see how we're going to score the items for um, the Eckers three. You will see that um, the ERS scales are on a seven point scale. So again, this is a new tool to Michigan. It's scored differently. And we have um, this particular tool set up on a one to seven scale. It's based on observed indicators. Again, going back to that language, um, those indicators that the um, approved assessor or great start to quality assessor will see um, in, in these um, particular items, actually great start to quality assessors for the ERS. Um, and so let's look at this graphic that we have here. Um, each column represents one of the, the scores here. So you're gonna see the one is inadequate, three is minimal, five is good, and seven is excellent. Okay, so let's think of this as um, some ice cream. This is a really good analogy for understanding how the ERS is scored. So think of the score of a one as um, an empty bowl just waiting to be filled, right? So um, this is at that inadequate level for um, early childhood, right? It's just waiting to be filled. Um, these would be basic health and safety issues. Um, at that one level. And then that three level is minimal, right? This is um, this is pretty good, it's getting there. Um, it might be a plain cone with a little bit of soft serve. Um, you enjoy it, but really it could be a lot better, right? So then the five level, that's really good. That's that sugar or waffle cone. It's the hand-dipped, uh, maybe triple scoop. Um, it's really developmentally appropriate. It is good. But it might just leave you wanting a little bit more. So that seven level is excellent. And think of that seven level, right, as um, that hot fudge sundae, that banana split. It's got toppings. It's got whipped cream and a cherry, some sprinkles on top. It is excellent, right? So that's just kind of a, a simple, easy way to, to think of the scoring for the items of, of the ERS. So um, we want to make sure that you understand getting all sevens um, really is unrealistic. Think about um, getting all sevens like climbing Mount Everest. Um, the climb should be rewarding, but very few get to the top. So thinking of getting all scores of all sevens, um, really, it's it's really unrealistic. Um, you might want to think, right, like, oh, I'm going to see some sixes and sevens. I'm going to see some, some fours and fives. I may have some things I need to work on. I might see some ones and twos even. And that's okay, right, because we're using this to inform ourselves on how we can improve the quality of our settings for Michigan's children. So again, not getting too hung up on scores, um, but great start to quality would never ever expect um, all perfection, all scores of a seven. And so we don't want you to put that pressure on yourself as well. Um, so in the next slide, we're gonna look at our threshold scores. So this is our process um, for great start to quality. And again, we're gonna um, kind of go over some resources here shortly, but this is the process. Um, for coming through, um, it used to be called STARS, right? That's no longer um, the process. So when we are doing an on-site observation, 
you will get that tool choice. And the Eckers 3 is one of the tool choices for many programs um, in that early childhood setting. We're looking at the little green circle called demonstrating quality. And so right there, you'll see it says meet threshold scores um, for your on-site observation. And grade start to quality, it says for the ERS tools, programs must score a five or above to reach demonstrating quality. Okay, so again, like I mentioned, um, we are looking at that average score of a five. We are not looking for all sevens. We are looking for a score of a five to reach demonstrating quality and knowing that there's always going to be things that we want to work on and we want a goal set um, to improve that quality. So um, for great start to quality, again, um, each classroom that's observed would have to get a score of a five or above to reach demonstrating quality. And more information is on our website. And again, also with your local Great Start to Quality Resource Center. All right, thanks, Kristen. Um, I'm gonna chat here real quick about the observation process. Um, so this is going to be a three hour observation. Um, this is the way that the ERS uh, scales are set up. Um, sometimes a, um, an, an assessor may come a little earlier to look at your materials, but know that the observation part is only three hours. Um, this observation will take place during the time when most children are likely to be present. Uh, we no longer need to arrive early to see um, those arrival times. Uh, we encourage you to let your children know that we will be visiting. And upon our arrival, please introduce us to the children so they know that we are a safe face. We will be observing outside time um, and you may see us pulling out some tools um, and taking some safety measurements. And one important thing to note is that there's no longer an interview um, at the end of the observation. We will no longer be asking clarifying questions on things that we did not see. Um, as always, we will try to be a fly on the wall um, as much as possible. Uh, we'll peek at the materials when they're not in use by the children and we'll be taking lots of notes. Uh, when finished, we will quietly let you know that the observation is complete before we head out. All right, thanks Haley. So as we mentioned before, there's lots of resources out there to help you. I know this was a lot of information today. There is help, there is support out there for you. Um, so we first want to direct you to our ERS webpage on the Great Start to Quality uh, website. There is information on all the tools if you go to on-site observation, but if you're specifically looking for information on ERS, there's a whole web page dedicated um, to that with links on how you can uh, get the book like we talked about um, if you are interested in purchasing the book. If you are interested in getting more information from URSI, um, there's links there for you. Um, again, Purchasing a book is not a requirement for Great Start to Quality. Um, if you'd like to maybe borrow a book, um, a scale book, you can reach out to your local Great Start to Quality Resource Center. Um, they may have one for you to borrow, or you could look at that together so that you are fully prepared uh, for your on-site observation if this is the tool that you choose. So again, a lot of information on our website, but I can't stress enough to make sure that you're using your wonderful resources in your local Great Start to Quality Resource Centers. They are a wonderful resource that are waiting for you um, to help guide you through this entire process all the way through your on-site observation. So um, definitely reach out to those folks. Please visit our website. I know that you've been on our website because you found this recording. So um, definitely um, watch for updates. We We'll put anything that we think would be helpful for you right on our webpage. This is our assessment team, and this is another resource for you if you have questions along the way regarding um, Eckers 3 or any of the on site observation tool choices. Definitely email us at assessment at ECIC, the number four, kids.org. And again, we can help you with some of those questions that you may have along the way. 
And that concludes our training. And we thank all of you for taking time to watch and learn along with us.